episode 23 uh, in a series. We are just uh, sort of in this in-between week uh, between our one-week training and our fall five-week. And so we have some D1.5 students uh, here, and it's uh, great to have you guys. It's it's really fun to start our D1.5 program over the, the summer, which for those of you <clears throat> via podcast that are not familiar with that, it's like uh, someone who's gone through Ellerslie that comes back and they go through Ellerslie again, but with some bonus leadership training, sort of like the why behind the Ellerslie, like why do we do what we do? How do we do what we do? And it's, it was so powerful over the summer. Uh, and so it's really neat to be thinking of doing that again. I'm, I'm excited to see what God has in store. Uh, just as a heads up, this week is going to be a little unique, and this is mainly for you guys that are present, even though it is for the podcast, because there's going to be a podcast missing tomorrow. We're not going to have the normal Daily Thunder episode tomorrow. That's a <clears throat> survival thing, I think, for us uh, to sort of make it through. I was uh, gone all over the weekend with my mom's memorial, and so Nathan took yesterday, and I have today, and then... Uh, I have meetings this whole week, basically. This is my strategy week. So we're going to skip a daily thunder. Sorry to do that, guys. But uh, there's all sorts of other people out there like, phew, because they're trying to stay up with our uh, our output, and we don't make it easy. So this will give those people a little opportunity. So episode 23, we're in a series called Spiritual Lessons uh, from Black and White America. We're covering a period of American history from 1914 to 1974. Uh, our last episode was lingering in the 1948 uh, region. Uh, I'm not sure which area of American history this one lands in, but it's it's sort of just what's called the Red Scare. It's it's not the message isn't called that, but the Red Scare is going to uh, be right after World War One. The Bolshevik Re Revolution uh, is going to uh, happen in 1917 in. Russia and the commun or the Russian Czar, who's a descendant uh, of a, a a line of leaders that has been in control for over 300 years, is going to be uh, actually thrown out and killed. And L Vladimir Lenin is going to come in, and the Soviet Union is born. And this is going to lead to various crises worldwide because this, this communist movement desires to spread like a virus. It like yearns to spread. That's its entire ideology. And so that's going to lead to the initial Red Scare in America following World War I. But then that's going to sort of at least die down or seemingly die down. And then it's going to reemerge in full force after World War II when Stalin refuses to give up his territories in Eastern Europe, and we're going to begin something known as the Cold War. And so that's sort of the zone we're in. World War II is going to end in 1945. And now for the next 20 years or so, we're going to have a very, very heightened issue with America and the Soviet Union and so if you really are going to understand this time period, you really need to understand that debacle, that challenge. And so this will be a little bit of a uh, touch point on that topic. So part 23, bleeding red. Some of you could say, I don't know, uh, is there any other way to bleed uh, other than red? And yet what this means is something very different than just you know bleeding as you would normally bleed. This is bleeding what's inside of you is going to come out, is the concept. So bleeding red is the notion of Americans turning on America to support the crazed vision of Soviet communism. And so they are willing, because red is the color of communism. I don't know if you've ever figured that out, but uh, everything they have is red. And so the reds is what we oftentimes would call them. And so to bleed red, it means that there's been this infection, this idea uh, of Soviet communism has actually made its way into Americans to the point where they are willing to betray our country because they are so devoted to this idea uh, known as communism. And this is going to be something that most Americans don't believe is even possible. And yet, uh, we're, that's the whole message. So this is source unknown. Technically, I don't remember who said this to me, but it was somewhere in my upbringing. If by the age of 30, you don't have something worth dying for, then you really don't have anything worth living for. It's somewhat of a depressing statement if you think about it. But it's a fascinating point 
that by the age of 30, you should have something that you're willing to die for. You should have somehow been gripped by an idea, an idea bigger than you. And if you don't have that, it's sort of like, what is life if you don't have something worth dying for? Because that's what you live for. You live for something. And so in this message, I'm going to be talking about those things that we are willing to die for. The noble idealist, risking everything for an ideal. An ideal is like the perfect form of something. If you were to describe like what you thought would be perfection, that would be your ideal. And so an idealist is someone who's going to live with this as a possibility, like this could happen. And we all, in a sense, have that at a certain level. Like as a Christian, my desire is to see revival in the church. My my desire is to see people humble themselves and repent and turn to Jesus Christ and be set free from their sin in mass droves. I want to see a great harvest come in, right? And this is, that's, that's the ideal of what I desire. Of course, my true ideal is heaven. I desire everything to be made right. I desire heaven to come to this earth and everything to be restored to the way God originally intended it. Okay, so, I mean, as a Christian, I'm an idealist in that sense. I'm also a realist in the fact that God has promised to do it, which means I'm not just resting on an ideology, I'm resting on a reality, a promise. But most people are in the realm of ideology, which means they have an idea or an ideal, and they want to see it come about. They don't have a promise from God that it's going to come about, but they're going to labor with all their energies to make it happen. And so the communists are going to be noble idealists, and they are going to be willing to risk everything to see that their ideal is made a reality. So here's some questions for our souls as we get started. Is there something that I would be willing to die for or that you would be willing to die for? And so I remember going through this exercise when I was in my 20s and just pondering that concept of, is there something that I'm willing to die for? And there is something for me, and It is Jesus, it is his truth, and it is my wife, it is my family. Technically, you could extend that and say if someone was in dire straits and they were going to be killed unless someone intervened, then I've even pondered the fact that, yes, I would be willing to stand in front and die for someone else. You know, this this is the way Eric works, where I've processed through, it's like, what is my value system? And what do I consider important? I consider life important, which means if God has given me an opportunity to express his nature, the invisible kingdom on this earth, what would I be willing to do to express that? So here's some more questions. Is there something that I would be willing to be imprisoned for? Because to die, that could be quick, right? So it's like a bullet's flying. I stand in front. Oh, I'm hit by the bullet. Oh, I die. Wow, that was very noble. Oh, how beautiful, right? But if you're imprisoned, that means you're shamed. That means you're going through a certain form of suffering because of what you believe. So that takes it to almost another level. It's interesting that that would be a deeper level than dying because dying is a pretty extreme thing. But to what if you didn't die and you just lived in this life but with misery because of your ideal? And would you be, what would you be willing to go through to see your ideal reached? And so is there something that I would be willing to be imprisoned for? Here's another one. Is there something that I would relinquish all my earthly possessions for? It would have to be pretty valuable, guys, wouldn't you think? If you're going to give up all of your earthly possessions for what this is, it better be pretty good. And so, you know, I've, I've pondered at different times. It's like, what if Christianity was, it's like, Eric, you have to be willing to give up every single thing you own and possess, every talent, every gifting, every ability do you have in order to get Jesus? Then I raise my hand, and I've already decided this, guys. Yes is my answer, right? Absolutely. What if it's like, Eric, you need to give up all of this, you need to give up all your talents, all your abilities for your wife so that you could marry your wife? Imagine if that was how the transaction of marriage took place. It's a very interesting question. And you're going to have, I'm probably going to ask some questions like, now, why do I need to give that up? Why? I mean, I would sort of like to be able to give my wife something, but I just gave up all my talents, all my abilities, all my resources. I mean, so it's putting me in a rather precarious position. But if it was the issue of saving my wife, absolutely, right? If I'm 18 years old and you're asking me to give up all of that to marry my wife, that's a fascinating question. Of course, I have had, I don't know if you guys have ever had a dream, but most of you aren't married in here. But I remember 
I was in a dream and I was married to Leslie, right? But in this dream, there was this other girl that I was getting married to. I was sitting at some table, some wedding table, and I was like looking over, I was like, so it's her that I'm getting? And Leslie was at the table and I really loved Leslie and I didn't love this girl. It's like, why am I marrying her? But I was already getting married. It's like somehow there was already some kind of contractual thing going on. And I remember feeling like I would be willing to do anything to get out of this so that I could marry her. So in other words, when you find something that is of great value to you, you're willing to give up whatever you can to get it. Is there something that I would choose even above my closest relationships? So now you take Leslie as my sample. It's like, is there something I would even choose above Leslie? And there is, even though that sounds very rude, but I would choose Jesus above Leslie. And Leslie knows that from the very beginning, that it's not that that's a diminishment of her, it's actually the reason I can love her well, is that I'm always gonna place Jesus and his priority at the top of my list. Is there something that I would be willing to suffer great pains to promote? And so what I've just described is Christian history. And the apostles are going to have this exact thing laid before them. Would you be willing to suffer great pains to promote my kingdom, to promote my gospel? And that's going to be Christian history in a nutshell. And so everything that we are talking about actually is something that we, sh we know very, very well and intimately as believers. It's, it's somewhat lost today in Christianity. This hearty givenness, this willingness to sacrifice all, that version of Christianity seems to be a little <clears throat> passe, even though it's the essence of what true Christianity is. The historic resolve. So this may be an imperfect quote. This is the way I have always said this quote, but if we looked it up in Fox's Book of Martyrs, it could come out a little differently. But this is the Apostle Andrew. He is sitting before the governor, Aegis, and the governor is furious with him because he's going around and he's sharing this gospel and preaching about this cross of Christ. And so he threatens Andrew and he says, uh, I will crucify you on a cross if you don't shut up and stop speaking about this cross of Christ. And so that's supposed to be the great threat. It's like, I will crucify you on one too. And this is what Andrew, you know, supposedly said in response, which is quite profound. I would have dared not preach the glory of the cross of Christ if I was first not willing to die upon it. For all of us to recognize that to really represent Christ well in this world means we should count the cost before we even start that we should recognize that to preach the cross means also the willingness to suffer as Christ suffered, to even die as Christ died, to be scourged as Christ was scourged, to be mocked as Christ was mocked, to be willing to do what Christ did. Christianity absent the courage to risk everything. So say we take Christianity and we gut it of this courage to risk everything. What, what's left? Because that's mainly what we have seen around us in today's version of Christianity. It's like it's there, we have this husk, but it's lacking something. And if we were to say, what is it lacking? It seems to be lacking that courage or that daring to say, this is worth everything to me. And so what's remaining? Well, it leads to a rather dull religion. And most of us would have to admit that Christianity today doesn't have a lot of spice to it. You know, we try and add, you know, some, some movement to it, some charismatic stuff to it. We try and add some noise, some emotion to it. But technically, what makes Christianity grand is the willingness to give everything. It's the devotion. It's the love. It's the, it's the fervency of devotion. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let him sort of answer all those questions and say, are you willing to give up everything? Are you willing to suffer imprisonment? Are you willing to even lose your closest friends? Are you willing to suffer pains in order to see my kingdom advance? And we say, yes, Lord. And that is the essence of historic Christianity. 13-year-old Eric Ludi. Could you imagine a 13-year-old Eric Ludi? Uh, rather honorary character, guys. I mean, uh, I, I, I am a little hard on my old self, but I, I look back and I am embarrassed. Uh, my mom really desired to see me awakened to Christ. And I wasn't too interested. I'll just put it that way. I was in the public school system and I was very much like the public school system. And I wanted to be cool. 
And my mom wanted me to go to a Christian music festival. So my sister was working down in Texas at this missions organization. And I wasn't overly excited about going, but somehow it was a family trip and we all went down to Texas. And we were, I remember we were staying in a hotel and there was this big, huge festival with all these Christian musicians, Christian music artists that were performing. It was an outdoor festival. And boy, did I not want to go to that. And Wimbledon was, was happening that day. And I really wanted to stay back in the hotel and watch Wimbledon. I still remember Boris Becker uh, was, was one of the stars of Wimbledon that year. And I just really wanted to stay and watch that. Of course, I, I wanted to do anything but go to this Christian festival. And I knew why my mom wanted to do that. She wanted it to influence me. And so what's interesting is we went to this festival. It was very hot and there were a lot of fire ants uh, all over the ground and it was very uncomfortable for me and it was not pleasant and I it was in a bad mood the whole time. And it was actually my mom that wanted me to get out of there. She, at one point in time, this music came on and it was, it was like dark. It had a dark sort of feel to it. Uh, and she was like, uh, honey, we need to take the kids and get them out of here. So this thing that my mom wanted to expose me to, actually, she was the one that was like, we need to get out of here. This isn't healthy. And so we were leaving. And while we were leaving, someone was coming in and his name was David Wilkerson. And he was running through the crowd and he was crying, Ichabod, Ichabod, which translates in the Hebrew to the spirit of the Lord has departed. Uh, so what's interesting is I missed this moment. I didn't get to see David Wilkerson doing that. What I, I just got sort of the fire ants and the bad you know, experience and the misery, and then we left. But as we were leaving, this is going to become the legendary story. Is First of all, David Wilkerson isn't going to be applauded for this. He is going to be roundly criticized by so many people for doing this. It's like, who are you to come into this environment and make such a stink? And yet he was like, this is not God's spirit. This does not belong in, in amongst the church of Jesus Christ. So it's interesting because my mom discerned something similar and wanted us out of there. And then he comes running through the crowd. If you can imagine doing that, crying Ichabod. <laughs> now, I don't even know. I don't know if he said the spirit of the Lord has departed or if he just said Ichabod. I have no idea because most Christians are not going to be like, oh, yes, Ichabod in the Hebrew means. They're not going to even know what that means. So I'm not exactly sure how that played out. But here's what's interesting. To me, I didn't enjoy the, the festival at all. What always fascinated me with the, was what this man did because I wasn't against it. I actually liked it. I was intrigued because that was the sort of Christianity I'd never seen. It's like, who would have the guts to do that? That's what stood out to me was what David Wilkerson did. And so as I'm growing up, I'm fascinated. In the back of my mind, I'm picturing, I've never seen that before, that some guy would be willing to risk his reputation, to risk everything to stand for the body of Christ. I've never heard of that. Now, we could have our commentary on if it was a good decision for him to do it, and that's a separ separate issue. But I had never seen someone with the guts to do that, that was a leader and had a platform to lose, that is willing to risk it all for the sake of what he would say was the glory of God. Here's a picture of David Wilkerson when he was young. I, I think he was a little older than this at the time. But this is that classic picture of him holding up the Bible uh, in before the news reporters. I don't know if this is the actual picture of it, but or if this is a re replay of it. I don't know. But in Cross the Switchblade, he's going to reach out to some gang members in New York City and get in big trouble. And that's uh, it's a great story, by the way, if you guys haven't heard it. So at this time, uh, my sister is going to be teaching Keith Green's kids. Keith Green is going to die in a plane accident. And uh, my sister is going to be teaching his kids. And Melody Green's going to write a book called No Compromise. And she's going to sign it for me for Christmas. And bring, you know, it's going to be a Christmas gift. And I'm going to encounter this character named Keith Green. Again, I had... I hadn't seen this version of Christianity. I had seen sort of the laxness. Well, it's probably not altogether that different than what you've been around your entire life too. Is It's just sort of this mediocre thing which accepts its mediocrity and justifies its mediocrity. And as a young man, I had zero interest in that. I just had zero interest in the Christianity around me. But then when David Wilkerson, I hear the story about what David Wilkerson did, it spikes something in me. I didn't know what to do with it, but it's there. 
And then when my sister gives me this story of Keith Green, I am going to encounter a man who is all in for Jesus. And of course, he's been influenced by David Wilkerson too, which is a fascinating statement, right? But discovering Keith Green, finding someone that bled Jesus Christ. Now remember, this is called bleeding red. I haven't even gotten to the red side yet, right? But when you see someone who's willing to bleed Jesus Christ, I mean, David Wilkerson's famous statement to Nikki Cruz, I don't know if it's just in the movie or he actually said it, cut me into a thousand pieces and every piece will cry out, I love you. You know, that, that's what's inside of you. That's what's going to come out in a time of trial. And this, this man, Keith Green, bled Jesus Christ and is going to greatly impact my life. The cover of No Compromise was that picture, but drawn. And I remember I thought it was the worst cover ever. But then I, I picked up the book when I was in college and actually loved it. Discovering Richard Wormbrand. So Richard Wormbrand uh, was a pastor. I know many of you know who, exactly who it is. But he was during the time of World War II when the communists came into the country after booting out uh, Hitler's Nazis. And so they're going to go from Nazism to communism in Romania. It's a rough swap. And Richard Wimbrand is going to become prisoner number one. He is going to be tortured, beaten, really extremely bad. And he's going to survive this, even after two different uh, seasons in prison and in solitary confinement, various things. This guy's going to have it rough. And he is going to now start traveling and speaking after uh, this. And I am going to, my brother is going to come up to visit me in Michigan. And he has this videotape. This is back in the days of videotapes. But this is like a copy of a copy of a copy of a videotape. And it's a really bad quality video. And Richard Wormbrandt, this old Romanian pastor, is going to get up onto the stage. He has no shoes on because he couldn't wear shoes because of the sensitivity on the bottom of his feet because they beat the bottom of his feet. And so he's this pastor guy getting up on the stage, sitting down. He can't stand, and he has bare feet. And I thought it was one of the weirdest things when I first started. My brother's like, you need to watch this. I did. And all I could say in hearing this man, first of all, he's talking about it the times he was tortured, and he's talking about what he went through, but he's talking about loving his uh, torturers. He's talking about the love of Jesus in and through this. It was so profound to me. I'd never seen anything like it. And this was my thought. I must have what that man has. So there's been something in me, and is, I cannot imagine that it's just in me. When we see something that is fervent and given and all in, it has a strange effect on us, as this did to me. I remember actually having a conversation with God. God, could I have what that man has? I want that love inside of me. I'd never seen that before. And I felt like the question came back from God, would you be willing to go through what that man went through to get it? Oh, well, God, is there a more simple way to get that? Can I just ask for it and you give it? And yet, here's the question. If you saw something at that level of excellence, what would you be willing to go through to get it? And that was a really hard question for me to answer. Would I be willing to go? What did he go through? He went through torture. I, uh, ah. I really want what that man has, but Lord, I'm struggling with the cost to get it. I really want the fullness of life, the life of Christ, but I'm, I'm struggling with accepting that it comes with suffering and difficulty. And so if you know me now, you know that I have come to the place where I have accepted the fact that it comes with difficulty, suffering, and trials, and I, that I can rejoice in those because they're making me stronger. They're giving me what that man has. And so I get it now. But this is a hard thing to work through. So here's a picture of Richard Wormbrand. Bleeding Jesus. What's your passion? What is it that moves you? I, I remember I used to ask my students that. It's like, do you have any passions? What's your passion? And, you know, I have a passion. It's Jesus Christ. And, you know, other people have a passion like sports and maybe, you know, art or acting. And they'll have different things like that. There's some people that don't even have a passion. They don't even, they don't have a blip uh, on the Richter scale of their soul. Nothing's happening there. You know, it's, and that's, that's something for me. It's like, well, ask God to stir you. He designed you to feel, to live, to go after something. You see, that something you were designed for is Jesus. You may not know that yet, but that's actually what you were designed for. And because of that design, 
counterfeits can very easily make their way into our life and replace that position of Christ, which is what's called idolatry. John 7, 38, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So when Jesus is pierced on the cross, out of, him is, out of his heart is going to flow a river. It's going to be blood and water. And what's interesting about that is everyone was shocked. You see, typically what's going to flow out when your side is pierced is blood. You're going to bleed red. But there's something about Jesus that is going to bleed this exceptional thing out, and that's living. It's, there's life because there's also uh, water mixed in with this. This is a river of life. And so for us, what comes out of us is something greater than what the rest of this earth will bleed. We bleed living water. So I'm not going to give this guy's name. I know that might bother you as we go through this, but I'm going to run into Keith Green's disciples. So not his discipler. He was discipled by like Leonard Ravenhill. He was influenced by David Wilkerson. Had a very interesting uh, heritage, but then he is going to take people under his wing too. And one of these guys is this guy I'm going to quote, and I'm going to run into him later uh, in my development too. And he is passionate like Keith Green. He's like just a chip off the block, or the old block. And so this guy, this young guy is going to be roughed up. He's going to be sharing the gospel on the streets and these guys are going to beat him up. And he's going to come back to Keith crying. He's like, they beat me up. They beat me up. And Keith Green's going to be like, hey, 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 come on. You're supposed to be rejoicing right now. This is an opportunity. And so that was Keith Green's response. Some of the guys like wiping tears. And like, what? Well, you're supposed to be hugging me right now. Instead, you're, you're rebuking me. I just got beat up for Jesus. It's like, yeah, and you should be happy about it. <laughs> so that's, that's this guy. Okay. Keith Green's disciple. So I'm going to run into him uh, at a, when I'm traveling around with this uh, ministry in a, as a missionary and I'm doing these drama things. And so I'm going to be at this one concert and I'm going to meet with him backstage. It was sort of one of, one of these cool moments. Cause remember Keith Green's life changed mine. So this guy was discipled by Keith Green and I knew it. And this is what he's going to say. Do you know why secular music is so much better than Christian music? Because the secularists are more sold out to their sin than we Christians are to our savior. So I always remembered that, and it always stuck out to me, that there's something to do with givenness that really matters. And it is true that if you think about people's devotion to sin, it can be radical. And you think about some of these ideologies, I'm going to be talking about communism, it can be radical devotion. And here we have the truth of truths, the king of kings to serve, who's given everything for our life. You think if anyone was going to be radically given, it would be us. And yet the church oftentimes struggles and we even try and chastise internally. It's like, hey, that's too hot for Jesus. Hey, hey, you need to settle down, buddy. You're getting a little too overboard for Jesus. Re so now we're going to get into our storyline, reigniting the Red Scare. So I told you the Red Scare was happening after World War I, where this danger of communism infiltration into our, into our country was a very real thing. So after World War II, America has a very big problem the Soviet Union. I mean, technically we're at war, a form of war. It's called the Cold War. And we have issues because so many of our key state secrets have been stolen from us. And guess who has them? The Soviet Union. Starting with the atomic bomb. And so the very things that we have as some of our prized secrets somehow are going to end up in the Soviet Russia. How? because of spies. We have been infiltrated and we didn't even know it. An ally who lacks the ability to trust. So in World War II, if, we, if you can even stomach it, the Soviet Union is an ally of the United States and Great Britain. So we're working with Stalin to deal with Hitler. And yet the whole while, the Soviet Union does not trust us. I don't think we trusted them either. However, they were better at not trusting us than we were better than we were at not trusting them. So the Soviet Union is going to have an elaborate means that they are going to use to infiltrate the U.S. government prior to and during World War II. So to the uh, Soviet Union, there are no friends. So even though they're an ally with Great Britain and the United States, we're not their friends. That's, they will never think of us that way. We are only co-belligerents. That's the way they would look at it. In other words, we're fighting uh, against Hitler together, but after that, 
they are our enemy. Vladimir Lenin said it this way, we must resort to all sorts of stratagems, maneuvers, illegal methods, evasions, and subterfuge to carry on communist work. That isn't a very healthy system, guys, that has to rely on that to be able to carry on the work of your ideology. It's interesting because Christianity is the exact opposite. What do we rely on? Well, we need to be humble, we need to be repentant, we need to be loving, we need to be kind, we need to be truthful. <laughs> That's how we carry on our work. And yet, how does communism carry on? Is all sorts of stratagems, maneuvers, illegal methods, evasions, and subterfuge. Hmm, I think we're dealing with the opposite end of the spectrum here. So the Americans are following the Russian diplomats during World War II, and they're following, they're watching every move. You know, we're learning this whole thing called spycraft. You see, we aren't that good at it. Uh, after, even after World War I, we haven't really learned that much. We're just sort of getting our game on, whereas Great Britain, Russia, Germany, these guys are experts in it. They've been honing the craft of spycraft for uh, decades, uh, you know, centuries, if you want to say it that way. And we're just sort of new kids on the block with this. So we're like following around their Russian diplomats, waiting for them to slip up because we know that they are up to something. I mean, they're, they're Soviet, Soviet uh, diplomats. They have to be evil at some level, right? And yet we're not finding them doing anything. And so surely uh, the Russian diplomats would be the only ones with a horse in this race, right? In other words, if you're going to look at America and all the populace in America, who are going to be your threats for the Soviet agenda? You're going to say, aha, uh -huh, look at, we got a guy here as a representative of Russia hanging out in our land with diplomatic immunity. I think that's our guy we need to watch. He's up to something. And what's going to shock us as America is it actually isn't the Russian diplomats. They're actually just being diplomats. That doesn't mean they're not helping and aiding and abetting uh, a communist government. However, there's something else going on. Michael Warner from CIA.gov says this. Do you remember, guys, we were talking about Elizabeth Bentley in our last message? Elizabeth Bentley's clues were key to the early success of Venona. So Elizabeth Bentley is going to be a Soviet operative, a spy. She's an American that is going to be working for the Soviets and she is going to come to the FBI and she is going to expose 80 different people in the government that are actually Soviet spies. And so Venona, which I'm going to get into in just a second, is a operation of the NSA to actually decode and, and decrypt uh, the messages, the cable messages from Soviet Russia to their uh, foreign uh, operatives over here. But we didn't understand what it meant. We had the, the data, but we didn't know how to interpret it. We had the ability to decrypt it, but we didn't, everything is code, even the code names. So if you hear that someone's name is Charlie, that's their code name. And so it's talking about Charlie, but who's Charlie? So when Elizabeth Bentley comes in, she says, Charlie is so-and-so. And suddenly it's like, oh, and they were able to start putting a puzzle together. So Elizabeth Bentley's clues were key to the early success of Venona. For the Bureau, Venona became a priceless window into Soviet espionage when it corroborated her rather than vice versa. It was also through Bentley that the Bureau finally realized that the Soviets had built an underground apparatus in the United States that was operating almost completely apart from the Soviet diplomats that Bureau agents had been tailing. This isn't even associated with the diplomats. This is a completely different system. And it had started in 1920. In other words, we're like mid-1940s. That's 25 years that something has been building to spy on our country. That's sort of a scary thing when you begin to think about it. So this is uh, the Americans thinking. But th th this would mean, no, it couldn't mean that, could it? What are the options? That means it's Americans that are a part of this system. That means good old-fashioned Americans are actually betraying our country. And this is an elaborate system. But why would an American do that? They have it so good. I mean, look around us. We have such a great country. Why would anyone betray their own country? That's a good question. Bleeding red. How did the Soviets win such extraordinary devotion out of the American populace? It's really hard to explain, and I'm not, I don't think this, is, this would be a good PhD course on the answer to that question, other than to show that they did. 
Herbert Romerstein, he, he wrote a book, he's one of the leading experts, if not the leading expert in the world on the Venona uh, papers. They're going to be released, so they're gonna be classified documents, and then in 1995, they're gonna be released to the public. So way long after the point that where they were needed to expose what was going on with the uh, Soviet Union and their espionage system. So Herbert Robert Romerstein is one of the chief, if not the chief expert on those papers. So he knows exactly what was happening in the Soviet uh, spy network back in these days. So here's what uh, Herbert Romerstein says. One thing is certain, during World War II, the Soviet Union had an asset that has never been available to any other country at any time in history. Foreign supporters whose loyalty was so great that they were willing to spy against their own countries. Now, I, I'm going to read that quote again, but I'm going to read it in a longer version too. That is an amazing statement. In other words, you're saying that this has not existed in history at this level where you have so much loyalty and support in a foreign country that they would do work no matter what it would cost them, no matter if they're incriminated, no matter if they're in prison, no matter if they're killed, they will risk their life to get this information to a foreign power. Why would an American do that? So here's the same quote, but in a longer uh, segment. One thing is certain, during World War II, the Soviet Union had an asset that has never been available to any other country at any time in history. Foreign supporters whose loyalty was so great that they were willing to spy against their own countries. Many worked in sensitive government agencies. These people were not the dregs of society. Intelligent and sensitive, often highly educated and sophisticated. They were willing to spy for an aggressive totalitarian dictatorship that was responsible for the murder of tens of millions. The majority of these Soviet patriots had never been to the Soviet Union. Think about that. The majority of those that were serving uh, the Soviet Union had never been there. Their loyalty to the Soviet dictatorship was manifested through their membership in communist parties that considered themselves part of a world party, the Communist International or Com Intern. So we have something that is very elaborate, but it's shocking, even to the American mindset, even to the, those that are in the FBI and the NSA, they have a hard time imagining that this is true. Most Americans still to this day struggle to believe it's true because of how it's going to be handled and how politically incorrect it's going to be to ever bring it up again. And that's a different story for another day. A guy named Joseph McCarthy is going to sort of spike the punch and it's going to make it very, very difficult from this time forward to actually discuss it in a rational sense. But we have a real problem. So the Venona Project is declassified in 1995, exposing a century of intrigues. So in the previous message, I was talking about Elizabeth Bentley, who was going to come to the FBI. She is going to publicly testify before Congress, and most people are going to call her a neurotic liar. And yet all these years later, everything she said, I mean, there's some exaggerations that she had in her book that she wrote, but is going to be proven true. So she was telling the truth the whole time. And yet history is still going to look at her as sort of this weird, you know, neurotic, you know, lady who had an interest in just being seen and noticed, put on, you know, lipstick and just wanted to be known she was insecure. And yet she was actually a spy. She knew everything that was going on and she actually came forward to expose it. And instead she was rejected. Herbert Romerstein says this, Venona provides us with a window in the so into the Soviet operation against the United States during its heyday. Did all this emphasis on intrigue and subterfuge matter? So the, it, since 1920, all the way through the time period we're in right now, which is around close to 30 years, did this impact anything? Did it actually help the Soviet Union to actually create this, it's called an apparat, in the United States? And yes, would be the answer. It did. In fact, surprisingly so, which of course is only going to increase the sensitivity of Americans to develop their own uh, spy networks because they're going to realize how much it hurt them uh, to have the Soviets do it to them. Herbert Romerstein is going to say this. Do intelligence and espionage operations matter? Was Soviet espionage a significant factor in the projection of Soviet power? Was the demise of the Soviet empire hastened, delayed, or perhaps unaffected by America's response? The answers. 
Espionage by American communists provided the Soviet Union with an atom bomb years before its scientists could have produced one. And subsequently, the threat of atomic warfare enabled the Soviet Union pro to project its power and to influence Western thinking. Soviet-controlled agents of influence in the U.S. government during World War II helped the USSR achieve its goals in Central Europe and Asia. The existence of Soviet-controlled governments in Eastern Europe and the Far East provided a valuable asset to the Soviet side in the Cold War. These successes would not have been possible without the active participation of American communists. We, American communists, those that are here, are going to actually sponsor the growth and the development of Soviet Union there. So you can sort of look at the reach of Soviet communism around the world, and you can say, yeah, that is a direct result of what happened here during those years. Because once a country has an atomic power, it can now threaten. And if you're a, another nation and do not have the ability to defend against that, what do you do? If someone could bomb you or you could submit, I mean, think about that. And for the United States, we couldn't just invade. Why? Because they have atomic power. They can send it this way. We could send it that way. Yeah, we could blow each other up, but that's the best we can do. The moment they got atomic power, we, it became serious. Pleading innocence. So here we have this American Communist Party that is actively working over here during that time, but it is covertly doing so. So this is the famous line. We're just a harmless political ideology. That's all. We have nothing to do with Moscow. We just admire their model of government. So ideologically, we esteem them, but we have no connection to them. So introducing Earl Browder, who is the leader of the Communist Party USA from 1930 to 1945. So the same period of time that is going to be the foundation through World War II. This man is in charge of the Communist Party USA. So I'm going to call it running the con because the entire idea behind the Communist Party USA is, hey, we are pro-America. We're not siding with the Soviet Union. We are pro-America. We just think that America could do better with this ideology. This is just a governmental thought pattern. This is just a philosophy of government. Earl Browder is going to say this. This is uh, a letter to the New York Legislative Committee in 1938. A familiar charge against the Communist Party is that it receives orders from Moscow, or that it is financed by Moscow Gold, or that it is a party of aliens. There is no aliens, meaning foreigners. There is no truth in any of these charges. The Communist Party makes its own decisions. It has never received orders from Moscow or anywhere else. And if it did receive any such orders, it would throw them in the wastebasket. The Communist Party finances itself entirely from its own resources within the country. Its membership is composed 99% of citizens of the United States. And all its members must declare their intention of becoming citizens if they are not already citizens. All right, now, here's what we have. That was testified in 1939. Is this guy telling the truth? Because maybe this is a harmless thing. Well, in hindsight, we actually know exactly what they were doing, especially with the Venona papers. We have all their communication back and forth. We know exactly what was happening. So if you go through the same thing, I'll read it again. A familiar charge against the Communist Party is that it receives orders from Moscow or that it is financed by Moscow Gold or that it is a party of aliens. There is no truth in any of these charges. That's a lie. It's completely financed by Moscow. Every single thing they're doing is an order from Moscow. Okay, that's a complete lie. The Communist Party makes its own decisions. It has never received orders from Moscow or anywhere else. And if it did receive any such orders, it would throw them in the wastebasket. Lie number two, totally false. They get all their orders from Moscow. Everything they do is in complete obedience to the Moscow system. The Communist Party finances itself entirely from its own resources within the country. Line number three, they get their financing from Soviet Russia. Its membership is composed 99% of citizens of the United States and all its members must declare their intention of becoming citizens if they're not already citizens. Line number four, but dressed in fancy truth. In other words, it sounds really good. Like, oh, we're just loyal Americans. When in actuality, they are loyal communists to Soviet Russia. Their entire goal is to have our country overtaken by the Soviet Russians. That's actually their goal of the Communist Party USA. Very clearly dictated throughout history and through the Venona Papers. The communists found their loyalists everywhere, not just among the disenfranchised. I think originally we would say it's going to be the working class, it's going to be the impoverished that are going to be attracted to it. And that's true. 
they are attracted to this. But for whatever reason, this ideology works in the higher echelons of academia, academia. I'm not exactly sure if I could explain to you why it does, other than it is opposed to the Judeo-Christian worldview that people would grow up with. And if they were hurt by that worldview, if they had a negative perception of that worldview, this became an alternative worldview. And so I don't know if that's the attraction. It's the same thing I could say about LGBTQ plus today is that it becomes a solution or a replacement ideology for something that may have wounded them or hurt them, which is the nuclear family is defined biblically, or is the gender ideology defined biblically, or is the uh, church structure as defined biblically. If you've been hurt by any of those, well, guess what? Then having an alternate worldview, even though it has not been time tested or approved and might have some shoddy holes in it, is still, it's going to be very attractive to you. And that's precisely what this is going to be. Many people are going to struggle as they enter into this in re recognizing that communism actually has a lot of problems. And when you have tens of millions of people being killed by the very system that you are following and you are a peace loving person, that's actually a lot of the people that are going to get into this love peace. They just want peace. They, their first instinct is they hate Hitler and they are anti-fascists. And so they are against the Nazis. That's going to be one of the key things that's going to draw many of them in. But it's not just the disenfranchised. Frederick Vanderbilt Field, for instance, is a U.S. millionaire, which back then meant a lot of money if you were a millionaire back then. And he's a, he's a purported Soviet spy. So some people just say he was a spy. Other people, he, he himself has never claimed to be a spy, but that's not uncommon. So here's uh, Frederick, Frederick Vander, uh, Vanderbilt Field. Here's what Frederick Vanderbilt Field said. Sort of a hard name to say fast. Uh, During those days, I unhesitatingly spread the gospel. So this is in that time period between 1920 to 1945. I unhesitantly spread the gospel. Stalin was infallible. All my communist surroundings told me so. So was Earl Browder. So remember the leader of the Communist Party? He was infallible. He was, uh, although on a lower level of sanctity, and so were the other CP or Communist Party leaders. Whenever a newspaper headline proclaimed some startling event, we would ask the first comrade we ran into, has Earl said anything about this yet? You know, we as Christians, we go to the word of God and says, what does the word of God say about this? They would go to Earl Browder. He's the United States connection because he's going to be the link with what Moscow thinks of it. That's all that matters. What does Moscow think of this? Because Moscow's brain was their brain. Red and radicalized, joining the Communist Party USA. So there's the Communist Party pledge. I now take my place in the ranks of the Communist Party, the party of the working class. I take this solemn oath to give the best that is in me to the service of my class. I pledge myself to remain at all times a vigilant and firm defender of the Leninist line of the party, the only line that ensures the triumph of Soviet power in the United States. So this is a strange thought for us, giving up independent thought. If you're going to be a good loyalist amongst the Communist Party, you do not think your own thoughts. You think what the communists ask you to think. And this is part of how it works. And to us, you know, it's a little hard for us to comprehend that. And yet it's as a counterfeit of something. And that is that as we come into Christianity, we are giving up our life to someone who knows better. It's true. It's the word of God. It's the spirit of God. It's Jesus Christ. He's the word of God. So we are going to submit our minds to him. And it doesn't mean we don't have independent thought. It's just that we are submitting our thoughts to him to be tested and approved. And we want our thoughts and our conclusions and our, the words we speak to match it. So we could be shocked by this. At the same time, it's a counterfeit of something that God designed us for. Uh, giving up independent thought. Independent thought is the stuff of lesser societies. I mean, those societies that let their people just think whatever they want to think. Oh, that, that's, that's what leads to all sorts of problems. So here's some unquestionables. These are things that could not be questioned. If you violated these things, you were out. We do not question, this is the CP unquestionables, this is the Communist Party unquestionables. We do not question the theory of the necessity for the forceful overthrow of capitalism. It's going to be forceful, guys. We do not question that. 
We do not question the correctness of the revolutionary theory of the class struggle laid down by Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin. We do not question the counter-revolutionary nature of Trotskyism. We do not question the political correctness of the decisions, resolutions, etc., of the executive committee of the CI, which is the Communist International, of the convention of the party or the central committee after they are ratified. It's the same thing the Catholic Church would say about the Pope. If the Pope says something, it is infallible. It is as if God was speaking it. That's precisely the way they are handling what is declared by Communist International, which is basically Stalin and his cronies. One of the biggest CP draws, so this is the Communist Party draws, anti-fascism. So in this time when Hitler is rising in the 1930s, they are very much against it. Hitlerism, Nazism, is going to be a very conservative movement, whereas communism is a very liberal movement on the spectrum politically. And most conservatives don't really want to claim uh, Hitler, and most liberals don't want to claim Stalin. And it's, they're both extremes on, on that spectrum. And so what's interesting is in 1939, something is going to happen. Now remember, the basis of communism is loyalty. Whatever Stalin does is correct. Whatever he thinks is right. It's, it's infallible. It's godlike, even though they don't believe in God, right? De the deification of man here is what's taking place. So what happens when Stalin and Hitler join forces in 1939? The very start of World War II, Stalin and Hitler are going to sign a pact of non-aggression against each other. They're actually going to secretly split up the, the, the countries of Eastern Europe for after the war, after Germany defeats Great Britain and France. And now this was all a ploy by Hitler to bait Stalin into being relaxed and at ease. And Stalin, and then Hitler is going to turn on Stalin, it's called Operation Barbarossa, and attack. And he's gonna destroy millions of Russians when they're unexpected. Their, their guard is down, why? Because they signed a treaty. Hitler is playing Stalin. Now, what's interesting, imagine that you're in the Communist Party and your whole thing is that you hate Hitler and the whole reason you got into this is because you are anti-fascism. And now, uh, guys, what just happened? They signed a treaty with your arch nemesis ideologically. How in the world are you supposed to handle this? But you have committed yourself to absolute loyalty with no independent thought. And this is going to create all sorts of unique challenge in the system. So Herbert Romerstein says it this way, Earl Browder, in a rare example of veracity, truthfulness, explained to the Dyes Committee in 1939 that members would be expelled from the Communist Party for refusal to carry out party decisions. He revealed that if someone's views differ from the parties, that means by expressing themselves, he is separating himself from the party. When asked if a party member's disagreement with Stalin's pact with Nazi Germany would result in expulsion, Browder answered yes. Expulsion from the Communist Party was a serious matter. It did not entail simply separating the person from his former comrades. He, was also, he would also be branded a Trotskyite and a spy. And uh, Leon Trotsky was assassinated. It's a pretty big deal to be associated with Trotsky. And a spy. So he'd be branded a spy. Isn't this interesting? It's like, he is a spy, but now he'd be branded a spy. Because, you know, just listen, I'll, I'll let it say it for itself. And party members were instructed to mobilize the children and women to make his life miserable. Let them pick at the store where his wife purchases groceries. Chalk his home with the slogan, so-and-so who lives here is a spy. Do you imagine, you want to stand against the Communist Party? Once in, guys, you cannot get out. You can't have your independent thought right now and disagree with the fact that Stalin and uh, Hitler just signed a, a pact, even though the whole motive for you getting in was to stop Hitler. That was your entire ideological motive. So let the children boycott his, ch his children or child. In that atmosphere, no one with an independent thought was permitted to remain. The party wanted only the most dedicated fanatics, those who would do anything, even spy against their own country in obedience to the party's orders. Whew. So seeking the apparat. So the Soviets, that's their term for it. It's called an apparat and though, through which to invade the current ruling system. Herbert Romerstein says, in 1920, the newly created Communist International, or Comintern, set in motion the forces that would provide the Soviet Union with vital intelligence two decades later. Apparat, it's also known as the party machine. The apparat, the smart sounding front for the hostile takeover of another country. That's exactly what this is. This is a hostile takeover of America. 
What makes up the apparat? Agents of influence. So what the Soviets need are agents that can influence society. They need people in high places. They need people in government. They need people in business. They need people who can actually cause things to happen. An agent of influence is set on subtly advancing the fortunes of another power while masquerading as a patriot. So their entire goal as an agent of influence is to look and act the part of a patriot to America. Meanwhile, undermine America. And I don't know if that disturbs you at any level, but for whatever reason, that deeply disturbs me. That is a very uncomfortable thing. It's a form of deception that reminds me of one known as an angel of light. It's demonic. It is very unhealthy, and it's something that is disturbing. All of spycraft technically disturbs me at a certain level. You know, you always cheer on the guys that are fighting for your side, that are double agents in another country that are working for you. But there's something about a double agent that is deeply disturbing, just to start with. So here's the question. Is it true that during World War II, the Soviet Union had spied on its allies? So here's Leonid Shabarshin, who's the head of the foreign directorate of the KGB. He's speaking this in 1990. So he was in charge back then. This is what he said. He said, yes, we had that task then on par with regular tasks of political intelligence and penetration behind the enemy lines. There is not and cannot be a full openness in relations between countries. And at that time, it was necessary to be on the lookout. We had quite good intelligence assets in the leadership of all military political groups created by the United States. We also had good assets in the leadership of the major world powers. Someday, someday I will tell you about this line of our work, but not very soon. <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't know that we ever heard it. Herbert Romerstein says, Meanwhile, it has become clear that spies in the United States speeded Moscow's quest to develop and test an atom bomb, perhaps by three to five years. Documents recently released in the former USSR, moreover, demonstrate that absent an atomic bomb, Stalin would not have unleashed Pyongyang's army to conquer the entire Korean peninsula. Changes everything, guys. So what this apparatus is going to do is going to change world history. And their use of our American system and our American... Uh, power is going to actually manipulate their strength. In 1939, this is such an odd thing, and I mentioned this in the previous uh, message, but in 1939, all foreign spies are going to be called back to Moscow to face either demotion or death. Now, they don't know that. They're just being called back, but they're going to have, it's called the purge. Now, I don't know because I wasn't a part of the internal workings of this, but they're wanting to cleanse out their system and have new blood in that is truly loyal. They feel like something is broken down over time. And so they're going to call back for either demotion or death. And in that time, listen to what Leonard Shabarshan says. He was, remember, he's the guy that was over all of this. So, oh, by the way, it says a checklist in the note. That's a checkist. I don't know. I think it auto-corrected it. But a checkist is a Soviet intelligence officer. So the checkists or the Soviet intelligence officers lost almost 22,000 from their ranks in 1939. Stalin is literally going to kill 22,000 of his foreign operatives as agents of influence in 1939 because he doesn't fully trust them. Uh... Okay. And are you sure you really want to work for this government, guys? I'm, I'm not exactly sure if it's a good idea. The crack in the dam. Now, I'm not going into this, but I'm just going to say Whitaker Chambers is the crack in the dam. He is an American who is in this system. He's an agent of influence. And in 1939, when he sees what's going to happen to all of the people that he's working with, he's going to go to the FBI and he's going to come out with what's going on uh, here. Now, whether or not he's fully believed, again, he's another crackpot, uh, but that's going to be the first uh, crack. Bleeding in a way that is life-giving instead of life-taking. So you could bleed red, but are you giving life when you're doing it? You see, there's a pattern, and we're going to see it on the cross, where Jesus is going to bleed, but when he's bleeding, he's going to be giving life to others. Remember, the, the thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that more abundant. How are we bleeding? How are our passions leading us? If our passions are leading to the destruction of others to fulfill our ideal, something's wrong with our ideal. Something's misguided in our passions. But if our passions are leading to the benefit of others, to the strengthening of others, to the life-giving of others, maybe we found something. The blood of communist spies, what was it spent for? A lot of them died, guys. A lot of them died. I mean, even by, at Stalin's own hand, a lot of them died. But what was it spent for? 
It actually has, was spent to create a cold war. It was spent to take territory and to bring into oppression. Hundreds of millions have been killed under this regime. This is a massive issue in our culture over the last 100 years. Now, I'm going to throw a curveball at us because we can cluck our tongues at communism very easily because we have a tendency to lean conservative here, right? Not everyone, I mean, you know that not everyone that comes to Ellerslie leans conservative, and I have evidence of that, right? However, you know, since I lean conservative, people have a tendency to feel more safe, right? And yet one of the things I've said about this series is I do not want it to be spoken as a conservative or as a liberal. I want it to be spoken as a Christian, which means we'll call a spade a spade, okay? Even if it indicts the conservative side that I have a tendency to lead toward, that's okay. I just want to walk in truth and honesty. I don't want to support something that is actually uh, problematic in a different direction. So the blood of political conservatism, what is it being spent for? Because there's a lot of passion, a lot of heat in that camp right now. Now, I'm going to do something that you're not expecting. I'm going to quote the disciple of Keith Green uh, 40 years after uh, all of of being in, encountering Keith Green and being impacted by Keith Green. So he's going to have the same DNA as Keith Green, but that can be misdirected too. And I'm going to say it can very easily be misdirected into these issues of political conservatism. And I would say it's very dangerous because political conservatives, you can spend your blood in that and it doesn't always bring life. It can oftentimes bring rage. It can bring animosity. We are so close to a civil war in this country and that isn't how we as Christians live. That isn't my enemy over there, guys. That is my mission field. And so don't try and bait me to make that my enemy. And so this is a response. This, this disciple of Keith Green's is, was wearing a Let's Go Brandon uh, t-shirt publicly. And he took a picture and was pointing at it. And so this other pastor who is, we could call him post-evangelical, one of the ones we would be concerned about, right, is questioning why he's doing that, saying that's unchristian. Ooh. Now we have a little tension, guys, because there, that, that's a, a really interesting point. Because those of you that are politically infused and have some red inside of you, like passion red, not communist red, inside of you for the issues of what's taking, politically, taking place politically today, can understand that t-shirt. You can understand why you'd even give a smirk to that t-shirt and say, yeah, uh, yeah, that's something you, that I might boldly wear. And so this pastor's asking the question, is that really Christ's love? Now this pastor that's asking the question is not necessarily healthy in a lot of other ways that we could all probably compare notes on and go, yeah, we're concerned about him, right? So how does the Christian respond in this situation? I'm just gonna say, is this the right way to spend your passions and bleed. So this is Keith Green's disciple 40 years later. It's a Twitter response to being asked by a post-evangelical pastor as to why he wore a Let's Go Brandon t-shirt. There are many of us on Twitter, says Keith Green's disciple 40 years later, who were entertained by your daily skewed, feckless lack of knowledge on most things, biblical, political, philosophical, culturally, etc. We laugh a bit and poke a little fun at you because you're so easy to troll. But those days are over because number one, your faux outrage in support of all things LGBTQIA plus is harming others. Two, your calloused response to the dear families in Nashville who lost loved ones at the hands of a trans terrorist is beyond the pale. And three, the Biden crime family is destroying our nation and you condone it. But lastly, your promotion of a false false gospel, your blasphemy against the Lord Jesus Christ and your denial of the inerrancy and infallibility of God's holy word renders you a false teacher. I rarely do this, but it's time to block you. What you represent is only damning to others. Okay, I just read that. That's somewhat of a dangerous thing to give any voice to. However, I want you to recognize a nature. You can bleed. You can bleed red, you know, communist red. You could bleed red Republican. And yet, if you're not giving life in your bleeding, I want you to stop, pause, and consider. I don't believe this is bleeding Christ-like. And this is, I could say it, this is one of the guys I've highly admired in my life. This is hard for me, guys, because I see the propensity of using the David Wilkerson, Keith Green, Richard Wormbrandt passion in a way where it gets misdirected. That's an attitude I don't sponsor in my communication. It is diminishing 
It is degrading. And even if you disagree with someone, that still isn't how you speak to them. I agree that where this man is headed is not a, a place I would like to encourage him. And yet that attitude, I don't care what's going on. We still do not sponsor that hostility in and amongst us. The misspending of our passions. It's very easy to waste our passion everywhere, but where it is most deeply needed. And I think we need to recognize that. The enemy wants to bait us. This is a generation, and right now the political climate is such that it is baiting us to rage, to disgust. I mean, all it takes is one little note coming up on your email, and you can be mad afresh. Do not misspend your passions. You have passion to give, but make sure the enemy isn't stealing it and robbing it. Just like the joy of the Lord, it says, your joy, your joy no man can take from you, says Jesus. Your passion, don't let any false thing take it from you. Make sure you are spending it exactly where Jesus would have you spend it. The blood of Jesus, what was it spent for? For atonement, for propitiation, for justification from sin, for the forgiveness of sins, for the remission of sins, for cleansing and washing from all sin, for the purging of our consciences, for peace, for reconciliation unto Christ, for righteousness, for the purpose of saving us from the wrath that will come, for the destruction of the devil, for overcoming the devil, for redemption, eternal redemption, the purchase of our very beings, for the purpose of giving us life within eternal life, for the bringing back to life, for sanctification, for spiritual and physical healing for boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God, for the purpose of enabling us to make our daily, hourly, minute-by-minute minute home in Christ Jesus. Now that's something to bleed for. That's what Jesus bled for. Let's make sure that when we bleed, we're bleeding properly. So bleeding well. What is it we are supposed to bleed for? Here's a short list, guys, just to get you started. The glory of Jesus. Jesus in us. Jesus in others. That's worth giving up your life for. That's worth bleeding for. Father, teach us to spend our passions well and to not allow the devil to deviate us off course. Lord Jesus, we need your intervention in the church today to save us from misspending our passion. Lord Jesus, show us how this works. Teach us your ways. It's in the precious name we pray this. Amen.